just um, brilliant. Okay, so uh, I will just open the uh, room for uh, participants and allow them in. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us on this Facebook Live. And I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Moses Batwala, who is a uh, obstetrician and gynecologist and a fertility specialist uh, at IVF London. And he's our medical director at IVF London. And uh, we've got the privilege to talk to him today about frozen embryo transfer cycles. And a lot of you may have heard that this seems to have become the norm now when it comes to IVF treatments. And you may have also read that frozen embryo transfer cycles seem to be more prevalent and the whole IVF cycle may be broken into two parts. Like we're the only way is to um, find out a bit more about uh, the frozen embryo transfer cycles and uh, we'll hear it from the gynecologist's perspective. So Dr. Moses, one of the first questions that I have for you is, how does a frozen embryo transfer cycle vary from a fresh cycle? Okay. Uh, thank you, Alpesh. Um, uh, so, um, yes, the, essentially in, uh, in the uh, IVF fertility process, there they are on, they only two ways, of, of, um, two, uh, ways we, we, we return an, an embryo, either in what we call a fresh, a fresh cycle, a fresh transfer, or, or a frozen embryo transfer. So how do they? How do the two differ? Uh, with a fresh, um, uh, a fresh embryo transfer, as the name suggests, it's done during uh, during the same uh, uh, menstrual cycle as when a woman is having an egg collection. And typically, a fresh embryo transfer would occur either three days after the egg collection, if you're having a, a what we call a day three embryo transfer or um, um, five days, when if you're having a blastocyst transfer, or even rarely on uh, six days after a, froze, um, a, a, a fresh transfer. And whereas a frozen, uh, and this, is, this would involve most of the time a transfer of a, fre uh, of a fresh em embryo. That is an embryo that has, was collected, uh, uh, where the eggs were collected about three to uh, five days prior, fertilized and cultured, which is grown in the lab, and when it reaches day, uh, day three, it's either tr it's transferred then, or if it reaches day five or day six, it's then transferred uh, in, into the woman without freezing the embryo. Um, and, and typically, the, uh, the, the drugs used from the time of the, uh, of the egg collection are mainly just progesterones that are, uh, are used. So it'll be progesterones in the form of either uh, vaginal pessaries, injections, um, uh, uh, or gels. Those are typically the, um, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the drugs that are used. And sometimes also things like Clexane, which, is a, which are blood thinners, in case of some women who have either clotting disorders, <coughs> have raised BMIs, or even um, have had a, 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 a past history of recurrent uh, miscarriage. Mm -hmm. how, uh, how does this differ from a frozen embryo transfer? A frozen embryo transfer, as the name suggests, is that you've already had embryos that were frozen in a, in a previous cycle. And uh, typically, uh, there, are two, there are two ways of doing a frozen embryo tra uh, transfer, the, uh, the most common. The first is what we call a down-regulation uh, frozen embryo transfer, in which typically starting the cycle before, um, before the, the cycle that you're going to do the transfer, typically day 21 of the cycle, a woman is down-regulated. That means that you're shutting the, uh, the ovaries down by giving them an injection that contains an agonist that shuts down the pituitary uh, gland in the brain and stops all ovarian activity. And this is important to prevent follicles developing during the time when you're going to uh, transfer, uh, uh, transfer the embryo um, uh, to, to prevent what we call early lut luteinization, which is when uh, typically when a when a follicle ovulates, it starts releasing progesterone, and once it ovulates, it starts the process. It, it kicks off the process whereby um, whereby uh, the, the the lining gets prepared for uh, implantation of the embryo. But these have to be synchronized. 
And if you don't downregulate to stop the follicle developing, it's, this can happen maybe earlier or earlier than when you'd wanted to do your transfer. And therefore, the, the endometrium and the embryo that you want to transfer out of sync. And that can cause, a, um, uh, uh, cause a, uh, uh, problems with implantation or no implantation to take place. And typically, this downregulation lasts about anywhere between two to three weeks. And then the, a woman starts her period. And then from the time she has a period, she has a scan to check that the lining of the womb is thin and the ovaries are quiet in that there are no, uh, no developing follicles or cysts. And then typically they begin, uh, the woman will be give, uh, continue still on her down regulation, which is sometimes the dose is decreased. And then you start uh, uh, taking oral, uh, at least at our clinic, IVF London, we start giving oral uh, estrogen tablets. Sometimes uh, other, uh, other clinics use uh, uh, estrogen patches as well. And this is again to just help thicken the lining of the womb. And uh, they take these, this estrogen supplementation daily until uh, for at least 11 days. That is from the second day of her period for 11 days. And uh, typically on day 12, you have a scan to see that the endometrium is thick enough. Different clinics have different, um, operate with different um, protocols of how thick this uh, endometrium should be. Some start at seven millimeters, others 7.5 millimeters. At IVF London, we typically use the value of 8.5 uh, millimeters. Uh, but also, it's not just the thickness, it is the, the character of the endometrium. And we want to see a nice triple layer. Um, and if everything is, 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 uh, is adequate at that stage, we typically give, um, um, we typically give um, uh, a start progesterone at, at that point, which could be in the form of injections. There, there are some long-lasting injections that, uh, that, that can be given once a week. Uh, there are some which are given every day. Uh, or we can we give uh, again progesterone pessaries or uh, um, uh, progesterone pessaries or uh, uh, which can be given vaginally or or even through the uh, through the back uh, back passage. And typically, as when you start that you, when you start the progesterone, you stop the down regulation. And uh, uh, and uh, typically, if you have a day three embryo you had frozen, you do your transfer three days later. If you have had a, a day five, a blastocyst frozen, you do your transfer, um, transfer five, uh, five days later. Uh, it doesn't matter whether that blastocyst was frozen on day six. We'd, we'd still transfer it on day, uh, on day five. Uh, um, uh, now, there's also what we typically, now that is the down regulation um, uh, frozen embryo transfer. And maybe I've also crossed over into how we, how we prepare the endometrium with, with this question. But with the with us, that, that uh, uh, we rarely use the down regulation protocol at IVF London. And the reason why we, we hardly use it is that there, there are lots of side effects associated with down regulation. It puts a woman into a temporary menopause and she develops uh, hot flushes, cold sweats, um, uh, vasomotor symptoms, um, um, mood swings. Uh, and this could be over a two to three week period. Uh, and uh, however, we do sometimes use this down regulation protocol, especially for uh, women who have either severe endometriosis mm -hmm. or even who have very large fibroids, because sometimes the, this down regulation helps uh, decrease the activity of the endometriosis or even decrease the size of the, of the fibroids to make a transfer easier. Um, so that is the down regulation protocol. And then the other protocol that we, uh, which is used, which is typically what we use at, at uh, IVF London is none down regulation protocol or co sometimes called the short frozen embryo transfer protocol. This typically begins on the second day of a woman's, uh, um, uh, women, a woman's uh, uh, period or cycle and which we, st we, we first scan to make sure the lining of the womb is thinned, seeing that the woman has down-regulated herself naturally. Um, uh, uh, and then we, uh, if that's the case and the ovaries are quiet again, we start with, uh, we start with the estrogen, um, um, estrogen tablets to help thicken the lining of the woman. And we typically give them for at least, uh, uh, um, uh, and we typically scan the woman 11 days later. Um, again, we give uh, tablets orally, but there, there are other options of using, of using um, patches. Uh, and then we rescan to make sure the endometrium is thick enough, at least um, uh, five millimeters. As this differs from clinic to clinic, 
and then we start the progesterone support. Now, I've spoken about uh, down regulation and non -down -regulation. there's another, another way of, um, of doing this, which is a natural cycle, mm -hmm. which is we don't, we don't, um, we don't, um, uh, 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 the woman gets, uh, starts her cycle naturally. Mm -hmm. she's, she may again be scanned on the second day of her cycle to make sure she's properly down regulated. There are no cysts. There are no, um, um, no uh, uh, the endometrium is nice and thin. There are no polyps in the endometrium or, or anything that could cause, uh, cause cancellation of the cycle. And if everything is fine, she's not given any medication but she'll be typically scanned about day, between day 10 and day 12. And what, what, what they want to see at that point is that the lining of her womb is at least, again, uh, between seven uh, millimeters and 8.5 millimeters as a minimum. She has a triple layer, and again, and, but this time they're looking for a dominant follicle. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want her to ovulate. And if she hasn't, if she hasn't, if she's not about to ovulate at that point, they ask her to start doing a urine um, uh, ovulation tests to see when she ovulates naturally. And then when she ovulates naturally, they then arrange for a transfer uh, three, um, um, either three days later, if she has got a day three frozen embryo, or five days later, if she has got a blastocyst. Now, sometimes there is some variation with the natural frozen embryo transfer whereby they, when they scan her between day 10 and day 12, if they see a follicle that's at least larger than 16 millimeters, they sometimes give, give um, uh, an H, uh, a, B, uh, what, a beta uh, HCG, beta hormone chorionic gonadotrophin injection to, 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 uh, to, uh, cause, um, uh, to cause ovulation. And then they start the, they start the uh, um, luteal support and again arrange the, the transfer three days or five days after. So those are the typical um, uh, preparation techniques for, uh, for arranging for frozen embryo transfer. Now, I'm sorry for jumping to question two. Uh, no, no, that's fine. In fact, so you alluded to the three protocols, namely the long protocol, the short protocol, and the natural cycle. So um, you also mentioned that the long protocol is ideally suited to patients with endometriosis or fibroids. How do you choose in, in your general population who potentially don't have any of these underlying issues, how would you choose whether you want to use the short protocol or natural cycle? Is one protocol suited more to a category of patients uh, compared to the other? Um, I'd say that uh, typically uh, um, it comes down to uh, uh, sometimes to the, the um, uh, preference of the clinician so, because all these protocols actually they have almost identical success rates. The success rates if all of these three protocols are, are done properly for frozen embryo transfer with correct timing, correct measurements of the lining of the, of the womb, looking at a good triple layer, they have exactly the same success rate. However, it, it comes down to one, uh, the preference of the patient, two, uh, sometimes the, pre uh, the uh, preference of the doctor, and three, the suit, uh, the, uh, also what, um, uh, how the uh, clinic is set up. Can it, can it, can it manage all three of these? Because, and and I'll, I'll, I'll explain the, uh, um, why that is quite important. With the two protocols, the, the down regulation protocol and the, um, uh, and the, uh, the non-down regulation short protocol, there is a lot of flexibility about when, which day you do your transfer. It can be, you, uh, and there's a lot of, you can, you can move that day about even up to a week. You can change, you can have a, a difference of a, of a full week um, uh, or for doing your transfer. Normally the earliest you could do your transfer is about day 17 for a blastocyst or day 15 for a day three embryo. But with, with, a, with the uh, a down regulation protocol and the um, uh, sh uh, short protocol, you could move that by an extra seven days without, without causing any, any, any drop in your success rate. And that could be important in case you, um, um, uh, a particular doctor is needed to do that transfer, if the patient prefers a particular, so that gives you that flexibility. Mm -hmm. However, with the natural cycle uh, frozen embryo transfer, you don't have that flexibility. As soon as a woman ovulates, to, she has to have a transfer either three days or five days later. Mm -hmm. They, that is almost 
you don't like stability. It's either abandon the cycle or you have to continue or to do the transfer. And if your clinician isn't available on the date you wanted, then uh, then they um, um, then you start uh, then you'd have to end up with a with a, a clinician maybe who you who you don't have a relationship with. Okay, so that's what I say that there's a, quite a lot of uh, flexibility. Now, also as I said, um, um, with the down regulation protocol, it it comes with side effects and it's longer. It can take up to uh, uh, um, um, five to six weeks before you have your transfer with the uh, um, uh, with the down regulation protocol. Where it's uh, whereas it's only about two weeks with the with the short protocol, and with the down regulation. You're giving um, uh, these injections make, make the woman have um, uh, all the symptoms of the menopause: cold, uh, uh, cold sweats, um, hot flushes, uh, vasomotor symptoms, um, uh, mood swings. Now, if a woman doesn't want to have those uh, the, uh, those symptoms, then she would ask for the uh, for for a different protocol, how uh, which is typically the short or the natural. However. If you are, um, um, if you um, um, have, uh, they, there may be times where we recommend this. And typically it's where a woman has very large fibroids and sometimes, and which would make, um, make it very difficult to get to the right part of the, of the endometrium to do your transfer. And you want to shrink these, these fibroids and to make the transfer easier. And so typically in those situations, we would be the ones actually um, advising that she has a long protocol. And also women with severe endometriosis, especially where, where they have maybe had a previous uh, um, uh, failed implantation or previous uh, miscarriage, which, which, uh, which may be associated with the endometriosis. And so in those cases, we actually advocate for, uh, uh, for a, a long protocol to kind of either shrink these fibroids or try and decrease the activity of the endometrium, which can affect the success of, of, of IVF, I mean, of the transfer. Okay. So typically the drugs that are used in, in, used in a frozen embryo transfer, and you mentioned um, progesterone and estrogens. So th these are considerably different from what is used in a fresh cycle, correct? So initially, obviously in a fresh fresh egg collection, the whole set of drugs used are very different to what we use in a frozen embryo transfer. What are the differences in these drugs that are used in the first half and the second half? I'd say the, the main difference, uh, although I have seen some clinics that use exactly the same, the main difference is when you're doing a fresh, um, fresh embryo uh, transfer, you don't need any estrogen uh, um, uh, medication. Uh, you don't need any estrogen at all uh, to, to thicken the lining of the womb. And the reason for this is during a fresh cycle, you have been giving a woman um, injections to stimulate the ovaries to, uh, ovaries to, uh, uh, to, um, to, to grow uh, several follicles to, for, from which you're going to collect your eggs. And when this happens, these follicles release a lot of estrogen. And that estrogen thickens the lining of the womb, making it thick enough for, for transfer. And that estrogen lingers on even beyond the day of your transfer. Okay. And be, because of this, uh, you don't need estrogen, estrogen supplementation during a fresh embryo transfer. However, as I said, there are some clinics that do give this, but in my practice, I've never ha ever had to use any estrogen supplementation in a fresh transfer. However, all um, uh, it, uh, now this compared to the frozen embryo trans, uh, uh, transfer, apart from the natural, with the natural um, um, natural uh, frozen embryo transfer, you don't need any estrogen supplementation. Again, you just allow for the woman's natural estrogen being released by that follicle that's growing to thicken the lining of the womb. But in the down regulation and the uh, um, down regulation frozen embryo transfer and the short uh, non down regulation uh, embryo transfer, you need that estrogen to thicken the lining of the womb. So that, that's one of the uh, differences. You need estrogen. And then also for the low, uh, down regulation protocol, you require, you require um, either, um, you require uh, uh, what we call an agonist. Mm -hmm. uh, um, injection, which can be give, given daily or can be given as a as a, um, a a one monthly injection, and that is that helps shut down the ovaries. Now that 
in fresh transfer either. Those are the only two in, two medications I know which are different uh, from the uh, from the fresh to the frozen. Which is and as I said, it's the estrogen supplementation and the um, 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 the, the down regulation injections. Those would be the two main differences from the transfers after that. That is after the egg collection. So we've got two questions that have been um, typed by our viewers. One of the questions is. Does IVF London offer natural cycle frozen embryo transfer? Yes, we do. We do offer it. We don't use it that much. And as I said, the main reason we do, uh, we, we do offer it, if, if a patient uh, requested it, it would be given. But we typically haven't been using it a lot, mainly because it is not um, um, of the, uh, once a woman ovulates, we, 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 we don't have the flexibility. And sometimes this, this could be, let's say um, uh, the, the, late, uh, the woman wants her partner to be with her on the day of the transfer. And if, if it happens on a day, let's say when her husband is away, away traveling, we can't change that, day, uh, we can't change the dates if she ovulates five days earlier. I mean, if she ovulates on one day and we have to do a, a transfer five days later, and on that day her partner is away, we can't, we can't change that. And so typically we haven't used a lot of natural, uh, a natural, uh, psych, uh, natural frozen embryo transfer cycles, but we do offer it and we, we can carry it out. As long as they, they, uh, the uh, patients are aware, we don't have the flexibility of changing dates. The other question that has come in is, would you recommend regular estrogen and progesterone checks during the two week wait after embryo transfer? Um, um, I would say it really depends on circumstances. Um, um, uh, if a woman, if they say a woman is having her first, uh, first frozen, uh, sorry, was that about just frozen embryo transfer? Or? Uh, well, I, it doesn't say so, but I, I presume it's in the context of frozen embryo transfer. Okay. Uh, typically, after a frozen embryo, we normally check the progesterone level. Um, we don't, at IVF London, we don't check the estrogen level of, uh, of women having, uh, um, uh, when they're having their transfers. And that's because there's such a great amount of variability in the, in the estrogen levels. The estrogen levels can range from anywhere. The normal levels can range from anywhere from 800 to uh, to ten uh, to um, uh, six or seven thousand uh, uh, during this uh, during a frozen embryo transfer, and so getting a figure anywhere between eight hundred and and eight thousand doesn't really tell us much about what is happening. And apart from that, it's not that the estrogen level has to be always climbing; it will sometimes go up and down, and that is quite normal. And so again, it doesn't really add a lot of um, information as to what is, ha what is happening with the implantation process. However, progesterone is different. And, uh, um, uh, and typically we want to know that we have su uh, 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 sufficient progesterone because progesterone is required for the, for the, de uh, for the implantation and, develop and the early development of that embryo from the time it implants. And typically we do a, 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 a progesterone blood test on the day of the, of the transfer. And we have our cutoff at, at IVF London. And typically, if, if the progesterone level is below what, we, what our cutoff is, we then increase the progesterone and recheck it um, uh, uh, roughly five days later. If, it's, if, it has, um, if it has risen above what our cutoff is, we maintain that. If it hasn't, we increase the progesterone even further and again recheck it at an appropriate uh, uh, um, a time. So that tip, uh, typically, if you've had, if you're, progesterone level is above the appro appropriate level at IVF London, we only recheck it again when we do the pregnancy test, which is 12 days later. You mentioned Clexane as one of the drugs that is taken or, or medications that is taken. What is the effect of Clexane and how does it help in a, uh, uh, in, in a cycle um, post-embryo transfer? Um, um... Clexane is a blood thinner. It is a anticoagulant. Uh, it, it make it it kind of decreases um, uh, the blood's ability to clot. And there are several reasons why Clexane may be used in uh, in the in the context of 
IVF. I'd say, uh, and pregnancy. I'd say the most common reason why uh, Clexane is used for women who, um, or who may be becoming pregnant is prophylaxis against developing things called deep vein thrombosis, or pulmonary, which are blood clots in the back of the leg, which can break away and go into the lungs, causing a pulmonary embolism, which can, be, which can make a woman severely uh, ill or requiring hospital admission, and can even in very rare occasions lead to death. So uh, most of the time, Clexane is given to women who have high risk factors of developing deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolisms in pregnancy. And these are typically women who have a raised BMI. Uh, that they're, they're overweight with a BMI over 35. So these are women who are normally started on it. Women who have had a previous history of developing a deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism when they, when they were even weren't pregnant. So these are the most common reasons. In the context of fertility, IVF, and, and, uh, and, um, and frozen embryo transfer, we, um, uh, we, we sometimes give Clexane to, uh, to, uh, to women if they've had um, a, a history of recurrent miscarriage, which could be two or more um, uh, um, consecutive miscarriages without having a live birth. And we screen these women and we find that they have a clotting, uh, clotting disorder, which their, their, their blood clots much easier than normal. Um, in the, in these, um, uh, the reason why it's important is when the embryo implants, it requires a, a, a good blood supply, uh, 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 which brings oxygen and nutrients from the mother to, give to, uh, to help the baby grow. Now, to, uh, the, the, the embryo is almost like a parasite biting into the, uh, the woman's womb and get, uh, attaching its placenta, uh, um, getting, getting into the blood vessels. And typically, if you cut a, uh, someone's, uh, someone's sk uh, skin, they will bleed. And if you put pressure on, they form clots. But in a natural pregnancy, uh, these clots don't form even if the, there's been um, uh, a trauma to, uh, to, to a woman's blood vessels. And it allows blood, uh, blood to keep on flowing and there's an exchange of oxygen and nutrients coming across from the mother. And then things like um, uh, um, uh, uh, carbon dioxide and, and urea and, uh, and all these things which, which the, the baby that, uh, wants to get rid of from the, being passed on to the mother to, for her to then pass out through her, through her urine or through her lungs, carbon dioxide through her lungs. This clexane prevents these clots forming in these women who are more prone to that. Uh, they have something called antiphospholipid syndrome. <clears throat> this clexane comes in and prevents these clots forming, and that can prevent a, a, a woman having a miscarriage again. There's another context in which this is done. A, a, again, these women are, are have a much higher risk of developing uh, ha, um, high blood pressure in pregnancy, uh, which is called preeclampsia. And again, clexane prevents this. And also women who have had a, a previous history of having severe preeclampsia during a previous pregnancy, or even having a very, a, a very uh, small baby born at, let's say, term at 36 weeks, and the baby was underweight, and they think it was because of placenta insufficiency. Clexane, again, and, and aspirin. We've been talking about clexane, but also another thin, uh, blood thinner is aspirin, which does more or less the same thing. These can be used to help prevent these things happening again in subsequent pregnancies. So, we know that obviously in a fresh egg collection or fresh cycle, one of the risks is ovarian hyperstimulation. But what are the risks in a frozen embryo transfer cycle, if any? Risks, I'd say, um, um, uh, luckily with frozen embryo transfers, the risks are, uh, are less. So firstly, and also depends on what kind of, uh, of cycle you're having. The first risk I'd say is risks caused by the medications. Uh, such as um, uh, the down regulation, it causes a woman to go into a temporary menopause. So a woman would experience the side effects such as the uh, menopausal symptoms, the hot sweat, uh, cold sweats, hot flushes, uh, uh, mood swings. Um, uh, she could have an allergy to these medications. So that's another risk. Uh, these are all extremely rare, by the way. Um, they, they could be an abandonment of the cycle because maybe even despite down regulation, a uh, woman develops a follicle, which, which grows and, it, and is secreting hormones, which may uh, uh, cause asynchronization of the, of, the, uh, of the endometrium and a transfer of the embryo. So abandonment 
seasons. Also, if there's different, um, sometimes, rarely again, you can develop fluid in the endometrial cavity during a frozen embryo transfer. This occurs maybe more so than, than, in, a, than in a fresh cycle. Again, this would mean that the, the, the environment inside the, the, the cavity is not suitable for transfer. And this would cause a uh, um, cancellation. Also, polyps, if polyps develop during your, your preparation uh, uh, period, you'd have to abandon, uh, ab abandon your frozen embryo transfer. Um, and then, as I, as I mentioned, um, uh, with the natural cycle, uh, uh, natural cycle um, uh, frozen embryo transfer, you, you are waiting for, for, the, uh, for the follicle to, to get to a certain size and then ovulate. And you typically do your scan between day 10 and day 12. But sometimes when you do your scan on, on day 12, you find, you find the woman has already ovulated. And if you've already, you don't know when, when, which day she ovulated, did she ovulate the day, earlier that day? Did she ovulate the day before? Did she ovulate two days earlier? And so you wouldn't know when is the right time to, uh, to put in the embryo and therefore you'd be forced to abandon the cycle. So I think, um, uh, and then also there's the actual uh, procedure itself. Some women may find it a bit uncomfortable. We advise them to take uh, uh, like a paracetamol about an hour before. Um, um, and there's uh, also the risk of, of when, you're, when you're actually doing your transfer, uh, and we, we always carry out all our transfers using uh, ultrasound guidance, that if the, um, if the tube that we use, touch, or the catheter, touches the, um, the end of the, of, the, um, uh, of the uterine cavity, it can cause muscle spasm, and this could cause e ejection of an embryo. So all, all of these are, are, are risks, but, they, but I should stress they are my very rare risks that are encountered. So one of the most frequently asked questions is, are the success rates lower in a frozen embryo transfer compared to fresh? What is your opinion on that? Uh, I would say the, um, uh, the biggest um, uh, um, uh, study that looked at uh, frozen embryo transfers versus uh, fresh embryo transfers said that they were uh, the, the success rates were identical. And that was, that was the, the biggest study. However, there have been other smaller studies that, have, uh, that seem to show that frozen embryo transfers have a higher success rate compared to um, uh, fresh transfers. But that difference is, is small. It's about, um, uh, it's about three to 6%. And actually, this, this was, uh, although uh, I say it was smaller than the, uh, than the earlier bigger ones, this was, this was a study that looked at about 55,000 transfers. And it was done by the European, uh, European Society for Reproductive, uh, uh, Reproductive Endocrine, ESHRI. Mm -hmm. And it saw, it lo it saw that, uh, that um, um, a frozen embryo transfer uh, with IVF uh, was about, had about a 3% higher success rate and with ICSI had about a 6% uh, um, um, uh, improved success rate. Okay. It is hypo sorry. No, no, that's fine, continue. It is hypothesized that the reason why you have a slightly higher success rate in the frozen embryo transfer is that the estrogen level is much closer to what is a woman's normal estrogen level as compared to the fresh transfer. With the fresh transfer, you have so many follicles growing and the estrogen levels would typically be up to anywhere between eight to 12,000 units compared to a woman's natural cycle where the estrogen levels are only about 1,000 when she ovulates. Now, it is, it is again hypothesized that this very high estrogen level may cause, um, um, uh, may cause abnormal growth in the, in the endometrium in a fresh transfer, but this doesn't happen in, in, in a frozen embryo transfer because the, the um, estrogen levels are almost the same as a woman's natural a menstrual cycle. Well, that's very reassuring for our viewers because uh, one of the biggest concerns that patients have is that with all these embryos that, are, that they are freezing, is it worth using them rather than going through a fresh cycle? And I think you've really reassured them that their chances of success using a frozen embryo is pretty much the same, if not better, uh, compared to a fresh uh, embryo transfer. So I think a lot of women out there will be very reassured that they can 
very successfully use their frozen embryos rather than just always thinking that a fresh embryo transfer is better. And um, the other question we had was, how important is the thickness of the lining of the womb before starting progesterone? So you alluded to the fact about seven millimeters, eight millimeters. So how important is this? Is it just the thickness that is important or are there any other characteristics during ultrasound of the womb that are important? Okay. Um, what I'd say is uh, there's been, uh, I'll first quote what is the uh, a strongest uh, evidence, and then talk about other minor things. The um, uh, NICE, which is, uh, uh, and the Royal College of Obs and Gynae, um, uh, and the British Fertility Society, state that um, if a woman's endometrium uh, b before, uh, before transfer is less than five millimeters, there's, it's almost unlikely that, she, that she's going to have implantation of, uh, of, her, of her embryo. So that is from, a, that is from the, 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 the best study put forward. And it just said that you are, le you are unlikely to have implantation if the uh, endometrium is less than five millimeters. Now, other studies not as big as that study have shown that as you, get, as you get your endometrium thicker and thicker, the success rate of implantation increases. Now, some studies have, uh, but it increases until it hits a plateau, where it flattens out. Now, some studies have, uh, which means that once you get to a certain thickness, it doesn't matter how much more th thicker you get, your success rate doesn't improve. And in fact, it says when it goes over 16 millimeters, thickness, you then get a decrease in your success rate. Now, um, uh, the cutoff that some studies have suggested is uh, uh, 7 millimeters. Uh, others have suggested 7.5. Others have suggested 8. And others have suggested 8.5. Okay. Uh, so different studies, not as big as the one that just stated that if you had less than 5 millimeters, you're unlikely to, to get implantation. But then there has been a wide variation of which is the which is the uh, what thickness do you do no longer get any uh, any added advantage, and as I said, we, what we know is that there's a decrease after 16 millimeters. But then where do we where does it stop g g uh, giving an, uh, giving us a, a um, uh, added success rate if we get thicker? Um, uh, I'd say there hasn't been any study to compare all these three different, uh, I mean, the four different um, measurements of 7, 7.5, 8, and 8.5, and different clinics operate with uh, different protocols. We at IVF London operate at 8.5 uh, uh, as, a, as a typical thickness where we would we'd then start giving luteal support. However, it is not just only the endometrial thickness that we look at, okay? It's just one aspect. And in fact, sometimes, even if we haven't reached our, our, our target of 8.5, we look at other aspects of our, of, 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 um, our scans we've used to assess, uh, to, to assess the suitability for embryo transfer. What I think is maybe perhaps the most important thing rather than thickness is the character. How, what does the endometrium look like? And we're looking for what is called a triple layer. And if you look at it on, on, on ultrasound scan, you can see literally three lines on the end of it, which is actually the three lines are caused by the two layers that the upper wall and the, uh, and the lower wall of the uterus meeting together. The upper layer is the, is the edge of the muscle. The lower layer is another edge of the muscle. And where the two layers meet, it causes a third line. And that's what we call that, uh, the triple layer. And I think sometimes that is more important. And I, and I have done transfers on women who have uh, five, uh, 5 5.5, six millimeter uh, endometriums. And these women have gone on to have, uh, to have implantation and clinical pregnancies. And that was because we're also looking at the character of the endometrium. Because sometimes some women, we just can't get their thickness, uh, the endometrial thickness thick enough despite waiting longer or even uh, increasing the dose of the estrogen. You also want to see that there are no other things that can interfere with the, with the, with the transfer, such as fluid in the endometrial cavity, okay? uh, because sometimes this fluid can be um, uh, embryotoxic and uh, prevent implantation. 
also don't want polyps in the in, in cavity. You don't want to see um, uh, fibroids, submucosal fibroids within the cavity, because all of these can hamper um, hamper um, uh, implantation. You don't want to see what we call hydro, um, uh, swollen fallopian tubes. Um, uh, we uh, we call that we call that a hydrosalpinx because again they can release fluid into the endometrial cavity, which is embryotoxic. Uh, you also don't want to see large follicles on the on the on the ovaries at that point. Then we're talking about the frozen embryo transfer because sometimes these can ovulate. And if they ovulate, they can take your endometrium out of sync because it starts the progesterone earlier than you wanted. And so all of these aspects are, uh, are things we look at. So it's not just the thickness. The thickness is part of it, but there are, there are several other characteristics we're, we're looking for in that scan to determine if it's suitable for us to proceed with a with transfer. So in women who do not make this lining of seven millimeters or, or eight millimeters, um, what other medications can they take? There's been some awareness recently in, 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 in the media about the use of vitamin E to improve the lining of the endometrium. What is your opinion on, on the use of vitamin E or Viagra? Um, uh, I've, uh, in my, um, I've read about vitamin E. I have not used it in my, in my own practice. And the the, when I've read uh, about it, the, the best study that I've seen on vitamin E was actually in the context of recurrent miscarriage, in which uh, vitamin E was used to treat women who had recurrent uh, miscarriage, and they thought there was an element of the endometrium not being thick enough prior to, uh, prior to, uh, to transfer. Now, um, I do not know of, I haven't seen any study that has looked at vitamin E in the sole context of making a woman's endometrium thicker to improve the um, uh, to improve the implantation rate, I've only seen a, a study that looks at it in it looks at it in the context of recurrent miscarriage. Okay. Whereas with Viagra, I have worked in uh, in uh, a number of clinics that use use this and successfully use it successfully as well. Where uh, and the 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 theory behind it is Viagra is a vasodilator. It makes it it. Um, dilates blood vessels, especially small blood vessels like capillaries, which improves the blood flow to the lining of the womb, making sure that there are good nutrients and oxygen supply going to the end, and that can cause a, uh, um, uh, a thick, uh, the endometrium to thicken. Uh, now, we don't typically use it as any, uh, as, as, a, as a first, um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to use, as a, um, uh, uh, as a, um, a standard medication in our FET protocols, we may use it in women who we have had a lot of difficulty getting their endometriums to become thick enough, uh, but we don't typically use it in, uh, as a, one of our standard drugs. But I have used Viagra in the past. I haven't used vitamin E, but as I said, the only uh, the uh, the only uh, the, st the strong evidence I've seen for vitamin E is really in the context of recurrent miscarriage, where they think the endometrium was or wasn't becoming thick enough. So one of the questions that has just popped up is. How does an FET work in terms of a woman's cycle? I am asking in terms of someone who has irregular periods. Okay, um, we spoke about natural frozen embryo transfers. And um, typically I'd say um, for the frozen embryo transfers, a woman can use any cycle, she, any, um, any uh, uh, can choose any of the protocols she wants. However, there is natural cycle, um, natural cycle uh, FETs are not suitable for women with irregular periods. And these are women who can have cycles which are sometimes less than 26 days or more than 35 days. This is the, uh, with these women, uh, a frozen, uh, natural, cycle, natural uh, frozen embryo transfer is not suitable for them. And they should have either the down regulation, the, the, the long down regulation uh, FET cycle, or the short, uh, the, the, the short um, non down regulation cycle. Okay. And this is, uh, and the reason for that is it's uh, it's very unpredictable about when they will ovulate, and therefore it can cause a very a lot of difficulty in planning, and also a lot of difficulty in when you're going to do your transfer. And so I wouldn't recommend a natural, in my view, 
I wouldn't recommend a, a, a natural FET for with a, with a irregular cycle, especially if it's less than 26 days. Her, tip, her cycles are vary from less than 26 days to more than 35 days. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers that question. Thank you, thank you. And again, one of the most common questions we get asked is, what are the do's and don'ts after an embryo transfer? The do's and don'ts. Um, uh, okay, um, I typically when after I've done my uh, frozen embryo transfer, I t uh, many of the women, uh, sometimes they've filled up their bladder, they haven't emptied their bladder for maybe um, half an hour to maybe two hours before the, the, the transfer has occurred. But when you do that, and sometimes they're even bursting before we, we do the transfer. But you find that after we've done the transfer, they're like, should they, they, they ask if they should stay on the, on, the, on the trolley or even on their beds for another half an hour or an hour. I'd say, no, you can go for a walk. You can go and empty your bladder. That won't affect uh, the, the success rate of, um, of a frozen embryo, of, of, of your embryo transfer, fresh or frozen. Um, but there are quite a few, uh, and also typically afterwards, I'd say you, you're, you're okay to go to work. You're okay to, um, um, uh, to go for walks if you wish, but you, don't, uh, you, sh you should avoid any activities that make you hot and sweaty. So don't go, for, don't go running, don't go to the gym. Um, um, and I'll come, to, uh, I'll come to that because you're trying to avoid uh, increasing your core uh, uh, body temperature, which can have a negative effect on, on, um, on the embryo. So I'd typically say try and avoid th doing things that would make you uh, sweat. We also advise... I'd also advise them not to do any swimming, at least not until they do the uh, uh, pregnancy test, not to go into any um, spa, uh, 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 spas, no saunas, no steam rooms. And this is to avoid uh, uh, fluid going into the, into the vagina and that can also make its way into the, into the cervix and the womb, which can affect implantation. I also advise, again, in the context of avoiding raising the core body temperature, no, uh, do, not ha do not have any laptops on your, on your abdomen. And, or let's say you like, like me, I like sitting down with a laptop on my tummy and typing away sometimes or watching, uh, uh, watching uh, uh, BBC iPlayer. Avoid doing that. Avoid having hot water bottles on your tummy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, this is at least until, um, at least until, uh, you do your pregnancy scan, which would be roughly two, uh, two weeks later. Uh, avoid uh, throughout the pre throughout this period and even through your pregnancy. Uh, avoid raw fish, avoid raw meat, avoid uh, soft cheeses. There is actually a very good website run by the NHS that advises you on foods to uh, foods to avoid during pregnancy. Avoid foods which are um, which are uh, which can increase the risk of you having food poison. This is really, really important. Uh, however, I also say don't, uh, don't go home and, and stay in bed for long periods. We want you to continue mobilizing. It, it, you don't increase your chances by going home. Some women go and have their le legs raised for, for a, a couple of hours a day. No, don't do this. Could actually be dangerous. Could increase, it could put you at risk of developing a deep vein thrombosis. So feel free to walk about, take things easy, and, and, and um, because the, if you think about it, there are very many women who conceive naturally and are, are completely unaware that they have, uh, they, have, uh, they, they have conceived and they are walking around, going to work, doing lots of things. And we want you to have that same journey as well. There's no need to take extra precautions, or, uh, which will not give you any advantage at all. One thing which I've forgotten to mention is pain relief. Mm -hmm. um, Paracetamol and codeine are, are, are safe, but avoid non-steroidals. Avoid your ibuprofen, your neurofen, your diclofenac. Avoid these after, uh, after frozen embryo transfer, but it's safe to take paracetamol and it's safe to take um, uh, uh, codeines. But I'd say that if paracetamol does not take your pain away, call the clinic that's looking after you and tell them that you're, uh, you're getting pain that's not going away with paracetamol. It could sometimes be a urinary tract infection. It could be um, a thrush that's causing this, but also it could be an ectopic pregnancy. And so it's important that, they, that the clinics know that you're having pain and it's not being, uh, um, not being um, uh, uh, relieved by, uh, uh, by your paracetamol so that they can decide how to further manage you. Okay, and finally, um, one of the questions is, 
is the embryo transfer painful? How long does the procedure take? Uh, is it okay? Uh, I'll first answer how long the procedure takes. We do our embryo transfers under ultrasound guidance at, uh, at IVF London. And typically the actual procedure takes anywhere between five to 10 minutes. Okay, that would be five to 10 minutes that the, wo uh, that the woman would be in theater uh, to the time she goes back to, uh, to, the, uh, to um, the recovery area. Is it painful? Um, I typically I describe the, uh, the, uh, the, the procedure as a bit uncomfortable. It's similar to having a uh, cervical smear because it involves having a speculum put in. Um, and different women have different pain thresholds. There are some women who find it, uh, or even a uh, uh, different underlying uh, pathology. There are some women who have vaginismus, um, um, which is, a, a, um, which is uh, they, 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 they encounter se severe pain with any kind of, of, uh, of uh, vaginal penetration beat a speculum beat even for uh, having sex with a partner and so they can find this extremely painful and uh, extremely distressing and in fact some of those women sometimes request to have a transfer under sedation however these these make up uh, uh, the, the the number of transfers under sedation is less than one percent vast majority of women 99 percent of women who have frozen embryo transfers tolerate them quite well yeah and uh, although I, I, uh, we sometimes advise women to take paracetamol an hour, uh, an, an hour or, uh, or 30 minutes before the procedure, vast majority do not take them anything at all and are able to tolerate the procedure quite well without, without, any, uh, um, without um, uh, encountering any severe discomfort. One of the questions that has just come in again is, is there a preference for using cyclogest vaginally or rectally? Um, I would say um, uh, uh, there are times when cyclogest um, rectally is of an advantage. Typically, if you use uh, uh, um, uh, cyclogest vaginally or rectally, the absorption isn't exactly the same. However, um, uh, there are times when a woman may get some bleeding, vaginal bleeding, uh, after the transfer, and sometimes this can be associated with. Uh, changes to the cells on the cervix of, of, of the woman's womb uh, and whereby she develops a kind of raw area, we call it a nectropium. And, and so I'd say in, in that context, we'd advise the woman to put, uh, and the bleeding can become heavier because of irritation when a woman puts in the cyclogist vaginally. In that context, we sometimes advise women to put in the, the cyclogist rectally to avoid that irritation to the lining of the womb. Now, in the context of, uh, uh, of uh, are there times where we tell a woman not to put cyclogest in uh, rectally, but to actually use it vaginally? One of the side effects of, uh, of uh, cyclogest is it can cause, um, uh, uh, it's, it's it causes um, uh, relaxation of, of smooth muscle. And it, it, it also does that to the bowel. And sometimes women get very constipated with, uh, with, cyclo with cyclogest. And if they're doing it uh, rectally, that can even have a more profound effect on their constipation. And so in those cases, we actually advise women not to use uh, um, cyclogest rectally, but actually to use it vaginally. And then lastly, I'd say um, uh, 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 many women sometimes find putting, um, putting uh, cyclogest vaginally, um, it, it dissolves and sometimes uh, when it dissolves, it comes away as, a, as a, a quite a heavy discharge. Um, um, and so, uh, um, if in, in, the, in that context, we sometimes tell the women to use it rectal, uh, um, rectally. Um, uh, I, and sometimes we even tell women to do it both, like to do it um, uh, rectally during the day because they find putting something up, the uh, uh, putting a pessary uh, uh, into the rectum uncomfortable. So we tell them to, for a balance, put, one in, uh, put it in rectally during the day and then put one in vaginally during the night so, so that you don't have the, 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 uh, the uh, problems of a, di of a vaginal discharge during the day when you're going about your day-to-day -day work. And, uh, and the women find that balance, uh, 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 cope quite well with that balance. And at least it helps uh, uh, not make their life more, uh, more um, 
uh, they they schedule more during their normal workouts. Thank you. And one of the last questions that has now come in is: Would you recommend an embryo, uh, an endometrial scratch? Uh, endometrial scratch. Um, um, I would say the it again. This comes down to uh, to context and especially the history of the woman. Um, uh, I would on, I would know. Uh, I've had many patients who have requested an endometrial scratch. Um, uh, with no past medical history. It's their first embryo transfer, uh, frozen embryo. First of all, you have to be aware that you can only do an endometrial scratch in, a, in the context of a frozen embryo transfer. Uh, and typically it's done at uh, day 21 of the cycle preceding, uh, preceding the cycle you're going to do your transfer. Now, um, I have had many patients who have requested a, a frozen embryo transfer for their first for uh, for the first transfer they've ever had and they've not had any any uh, any relevant past medical history in the past uh, what has been found there was quite a, a large study that was done i think in new zealand or australia uh, last year it found that there is absolutely no advantage no increase in success rate in doing a frozen uh, doing an endometrial scratch in women who uh, in their first or second cycles without, a rele without any relevant past medical history. However, what, where I have found that there is um, uh, uh, some good evidence for uh, an endometrial scratch is for women who have had two or more miscarriages in the past. Um, uh, um, th that's where I find that there is, there is some good evidence for me to even recommend having an endometrial scratch. And so that is typically a woman who has had two or more miscarriages in, 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 in the past um, uh, and has not had any, any subsequent uh, live birth. Uh, does, uh, does, does that answer that yes. question? Yes, thank you so much. And um, you know, there's so many patients who are essentially now waiting to resume their treatment because obviously clinics were told to um, cease all fertility treatments. And many patients are now, um, you know, wondering when this embargo is going to be lifted. But when it is lifted, what reassurances can their clinician or their gynecologist give them on the safety of them resuming uh, their treatment in light of COVID-19? Should they be worried about getting back to fertility treatment uh, in view of the risks that they may encounter with COVID-19? Um, I'll, um, I, uh, I th thank you for that question. And actually it's a, it's a really important question taking into the context of the times we, we're, we're in at the moment. Uh, what I'd say is that the, the COVID-19 is, is a very new uh, pathogen and we're still getting a lot of data coming in. But I'll, I'll go through the, um, uh, some of the relevant things when it comes to COVID, uh, to COVID and pregnancy. So firstly, um, uh, the Public Health England has said pregnant women are, no, are not more vulnerable to, uh, to um, uh, 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 becoming infected or developing the symptoms of uh, COVID-19 more than the general, uh, the general public for people their, their, of their equivalent age. And most pregnant women are kind of between the ages of 30, uh, I mean, uh, uh, most IVF patients are between the ages of 30 and 45. And these are typically um, age groups which are not uh, are particularly of high risk of fatality uh, from COVID-19. Not that it's zero, but the risk is small. And uh, also women have a much lower risk than men of, of, of uh, actually having a, um, either severe, uh, severe um, um, uh, coronavirus infection or even uh, uh, fatality. Okay, so that's why, and uh, 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 as I said, Public Health England has said they are no more vulnerable than the general public for their age range. So that's a, one a reassuring thing. It doesn't say that the risk is zero, but it says it doesn't make, you're not at higher, higher risk. How, um, uh, there are worries about, there have been, there's no evidence that developing COVID-19 increases the risk of abnormality or miscarriage uh, during pregnancy. So again, those are reassuring signs. However, uh, uh, in the context of pregnancy, especially in the third trimester, 
if someone was to develop an it's from 24 weeks onwards of, of, of pregnancy. If a woman was to develop a serious COVID-19 infection after 24 weeks gestation, it makes it very, because of her gravid uterus, a big uterus which is pressing on the diaphragm and the lungs, it can sometimes make resuscitation or ventilation if you develop a, um, a, a, a severe infection much more difficult. And sometimes that can precipitate um, uh, um, uh, your obstetrician and your, uh, you, the, uh, the anesthetist looking out, uh, and the ICU specialist looking after you to recommend um, delivering the baby earlier than, 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 would, be, uh, than would be normal, like a, a prematurely at 28 weeks or 30 weeks. And this is to make it easier to help your, with the woman's ventilation. So th these are things to consider. Uh, and then, um, uh, uh, last, the, the last, uh, last cases, there was talk that women's immune systems are weakened during pregnancy. But as, again, as I've stated, they, it hasn't been, uh, Public Health England hasn't, hasn't seen the vulnerability, the, uh, incre it hasn't seen increased uh, risk of infection or, uh, or the infection becoming uh, more severe in pregnant women. Uh, uh, lastly, it's about transmission. Is there, uh, is there a risk of transmitting the, the virus to the baby when the baby uh, is in, in utero? They, again, there hasn't, we are still getting data, but there hasn't been any proven case of a mother transferring, who acquires the infection, transferring it to her baby. There have been some babies who have acquired it after delivery, but they think it, it has been acquired from either the staff or even the, the mother passing it on after delivery, not during the delivery. And I, I'd like to add, obviously, from the uh, clinic perspective, I'm sure when um, the activity resumes, the regulators will come up with a whole load of social distancing measures that clinics will also need to follow before they, um, and, and I'm sure clinics will not be able to start with the full workload that they uh, had before they closed down. So just as a, another layer of reassurance to patients, who will be starting treatment after uh, the embargo is lifted, there will be certain measures in place which will additionally uh, minimize any cross-infection -infec because of social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, triaging. Um, so there will be a lot more um, protocols in place to safeguard our patients when they will start treatment when the lockdown is over. One of the two questions that have come in, Dr. Moses, is is there also going to be a likelihood that there will be a backlog in NHS or private treatments uh, in terms of the lockdown? Will people who were just at the start of their journey end up having to wait longer when it all starts up? Um, one, I can't speak for the NHS because uh, I, I, uh, currently I don't, um, uh, I don't, I used to work in, in an NHS IVF center. I'm not sure what what um, uh, what provisions the NHS uh, fer uh, fertility clinics are making uh, for or when uh, when they restart. I also can't really uh, speak on behalf of other private IVF clinics because uh, different clinics have different arrangements. Some of them have doctors who work in the NHS most of the time and uh, uh, and uh, uh, just do uh, do uh, fertility treatment part time. So I again can't really speak about what other clinics would, uh, would, um, would have in place. What I can say, uh, what I can uh, freely talk about is IVF, uh, IVF London. I, uh, as, a, as the medical director, I do not anticipate any, um, any backlog at all. As soon as the clinic is open, we'll be back to, um, to a normal practice. We will be able, if I, uh, we typically uh, start us our stimulation as soon as a woman's uh, period begins, and we'll be able to manage any patient uh, right from the start. So uh, from IVF London's uh, um, uh, pos position, I do not anticipate any backlog at all. That, that That's brilliant. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. It's been very, very educational. One of the comments that has come in, just wanted to say a very big thank you to you both for this as it's been very informative and you answered all my questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Moses. Absolutely 
very, um, very enlightening, very educational. I think you've reassured a lot of our viewers with regards to several questions that they have potentially may have had with regards to resuming treatment, but not only that, but also about the frozen embryo transfer procedure. So thank you so much. And we look forward to having another session soon, potentially in the next week or so, where we'll be talk talking about a new topic altogether. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye Thank, bye. You. Thank stay, you. Stay safe and stay at home, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.